This is Jubilee for the Earth, a podcast about biodiversity and our sacred story. My name is Wesley Cocazello, and I'm a member of the Justice, Peace, and Ecology team for the Missionary Society of St. Columban. We are a society of priests and lay people who live and share the good news of the gospel by working with those who are poor and exploited, including the Earth. Our patron, St. Columban, famously said, If you want to know the Creator, look at creation. As Catholics, Columbans believe that creation, animals, plants, ecosystems, and all natural things is a sacred gift from God, and that God has revealed to us through each member of creation. Thanks to generations of scientists who have researched how the earth works, all of us can rejoice in the beauty and the bounty of our planet. At the same time, we can better understand how to live within its limits. In 2019, an international group of scientists predicted that up to one million plant and animal species face extinction due to human activities. This mass extinction has already started, and it will be more severe and longer lasting than any previous mass extinction event in history. Now more than ever, we know how urgent it is for us as humans to heal our broken relationship with the rest of God's creation. In these six episodes, We'll explore the beauty of biodiversity and the threats it faces. We'll travel around the world to hear from Columbans who are working to renew the face of the earth. Grounded in Catholic social teaching, we hope that this podcast will help all of us to see how caring for our common home is fundamental to our lives as people of faith and as global citizens. Episode 1, The Spirituality of Biodiversity. In section 33 of Laudato Si, Pope Francis highlights that all species give glory to God by their very existence. And presumably we can say that there's some dimension of God, some dimension of God's creativity in every species. That was Father Dan Troy. Father Troy is a Columban priest who's been living in China since 2000. As part of his ecological work, he facilitates workshops for Chinese priests and sisters to help them promote the message of Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. Father Troy is speaking with Dr. John Fian, an Irish geologist and botanist who has written extensively about the interface between religion and science. For 20 years, Dr. Fian was a senior lecturer in the School of Agriculture and Food Science at University College Dublin. He is an award-winning environmental communicator who advocates for maintaining rural biodiversity and cultural heritage. The forward march of our understanding, of human scientific understanding, um, it gives us an ever deeper understanding of what creation actually means. You know, every day uh, as our knowledge grows, uh, we see with ever greater clarity that every creature Every other creature essentially is made with the same uh, loving care that we've all come from God's hand in uh, that awesome process of unfolding that we in our time have come come to call evolution. And our role uh, is to further God's plan in this. Uh, As Laudato Si reminds us in those very words, I think, uh, on, on one occasion, our plan here, our role here, is to further God's plan. Uh, And the the, the first task we're faced with is to deepen our understanding of what God's plan actually is. Uh, So often uh, our understanding of what God's plan is is limited to how it affects us in our small lives, uh, whether climate change is going to uh, disturb our well-being or whether the extremes of biodiversity is going to take resources away from us, etc. Uh, but the deeper spiritual understanding is to try to get behind that to see what does this mean uh, in, 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 in a theocentric way, if that's the right phrase to use it, in, 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 in God's own plan, in God's mind. You, you, you remember that phrase in Laudato Si, um, by, their, by their very existence, they give him glory. By their mere existence, they give him glory. And I suppose, John, the, you know, the, the Bible tells us that uh, our just and loving God created a just and loving people. And I suppose within that approach, how does the rest of creation, in all its diversity, fit yeah. into God's plan? The story of the Bible really described the growth in awareness of what it means to be a chosen people. 
Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and that sense of being chosen is the spark that kindles our sense of community. And ultimately everything else follows from that. Yeah? Uh, you see, at the very heart of Christianity, the very heart of Christianity, uh, of what, it's, what, what it, it's all about really is, if you think of it, it's an understanding that the community of the chosen is not defined by nation, color, or gender, uh, but extends to embrace the whole of humanity. Yeah? I mean, that's, that's where Christianity builds or moves forward out of the biblical uh, understanding. Our, our growing understanding of what biodiversity is all about. I'll go back to that phrase that we are all uh, made with, on every level that every level that scientific inquiry can study, we are all made with the same loving care, the same complexity, the same evolutionary history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what that enables us to do is, 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 is um, to extend further uh, not just the whole of humanity, but that growing understanding of what biodiversity means, uh, that calls us to extend that community embrace to the whole of living reality, the whole of creation base. That truly, and this is not merely a loose poetic phrase, that truly we are all brothers and sisters. As over the last number of centuries, we've become much more aware of the, the incredible numbers of species on the planet. Yeah. You yeah. know, quite unlike yeah. anything that was possible a thousand years ago. Yeah, so numbers, and, and the, the point there, Dan, is numbers incomprehensible. Uh, I mean, yeah. the more we, it is quite clear, for example, that the vast majority of what we call species of living reality, we, know, we don't know anything about them. We don't even know that, that they exist, except that, you know, our, 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 our growing understanding of what's going on tells us that, 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 that we don't. Um, one thing that's been uh, striking me more of late is if, if you go back to uh, the sort of heyday in, uh, in, in the growth of, uh, of our appreciation of the complexity and diversity and extraordinariness of all the individual species that make, that make if that was really beginning to grow in the, 18, 18, in the early 19th century. It was uh, universally accompanied by this deep sense of, of awe. Uh, religious awe uh, about the uh, about the nature of the God behind all of, all of this, and mm -hmm. what I find striking is the way in which that growth in understanding and appreciation has continued and has grown exponentially to our own day. But uh, the sense of awe and wonder and uh, and, and and of seeking to understand the the, the, the root of what lies behind it. The nature of the Godhead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that that's stultified. It should have grown uh, commensurably with the growth in awareness and understanding and appreciation of of what living reality, created reality, really is all about. But it just it, it, it almost disappeared. I mean, there's no. It's a flat. It flatlines. If you look at if you look at the theology. If you look at the growth of theology through the late 18th century, through the, especially in Catholic theology, uh, you find it that whereas it, what all that, that growing understanding should have fed into theology, uh, mm -hmm. theology and the spirituality that, that theology grounds, um, it, it, should have, it should have blossomed, it should have grown, it should have deepened uh, our awareness, etc. But it, it, it simply didn't. And what we are trying to do now is 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 to try to, to catch up in a sense. I mean, it's acknowledged now uh, by those who understand biodiversity loss that on a daily basis species yeah. are becoming extinct around the world, and I mean, in reality, that means that the fabric of life is yeah. unraveling, yeah. and I mean. What are the consequences, as you see it, for the unraveling of that fab fabric yeah. of life? It's almost invariably when we talk about uh, biodiversity loss and the, the, the consequences for, for, for humanity, it is the poorest people who are almost invariably most, most directly affected. And that's, that's what makes it a moral issue and grounds uh, our, what we can call our Columban engagement with it, because it becomes... Yeah. And therefore, 
uh, in order to appreciate the scale of that, that moral issue and the challenge that it represents, it is important to understand in as much detail, as much scientific, grounded, experiential detail as possible, uh, the, the nature of the ecological side of it. Okay? So to be well aware of just what, what, what's precisely going on. But again, and this links back to our first question, that, that more deeply and beyond all these human-centered considerations, uh, there's that there, there's the, the theocentric issue that this uh, that this is wrong. Yeah? This is wrong in itself. It goes against God's plan for creation. Uh, and here we're back that point I made earlier, Dan, about the halting nature of our language when we talk about God's plan for creation. You know, um, which is so utterly beyond uh, our human ability can, can, can never enable us to get any real grasp on it. That's um, why I uh, like to use a metaphor uh, in, in, in trying to express this. And I'll, I'll, I'll read it out because I, I, it's maybe the best way I can answer it. Um, it is given to us. It is our unique privilege and responsibility to care for the earth, not as we would care for the garden in which we grow our vegetables. Our unique privilege and responsibility to care for the earth, not as we would care for a garden in which we grow our vegetables, but because it is the garden God walks in, and we have been invited to walk with him. We are placed in this garden of Eden to share in God's own wonder and delight in his creation, ourselves alone endowed with that gift of mind that enables us to tend and nurture it as God wants us to tend it. It's a metaphor, but uh, so deep, so utterly beyond human ability to grasp it. Maybe that's, maybe that's the best our, our, our child's language uh, uh, can, can reach at this juncture of human evolution. You know, I live here in China. What I notice is that there's a great uh, foundation within the culture that, that is closely linked with nature. Perhaps you're familiar with the Chinese brush ink paintings, you know, and on, on a huge yeah. sheet of paper yeah, from indeed, top to yeah. bottom. You yeah. know, they can have the clouds, the mountains, the trees, and yeah. then down towards the, the middle, uh, they have the people who are very small. Um, and the Chinese people can look at those for hours and hours and appreciate them in a very special way. And I, I suppose my view would be that, you know, in China, that that, that is the, the medium through which young Chinese people can deepen their appreciation of the natural world yeah. and connect it with where the country is at the moment. Yeah. You know, in terms of huge industrial change, but huge impact on the environment. Mm. But I would, I would, I would say that uh, it is, it is the case in every culture, uh, and I think, I think it doesn't matter to what part of the world you go, you're going to find that uh, nature, in traditional culture particularly, uh, uh, nature was part of everyday, every, everyday experience. The possibility uh, of that ordinary encounter, that presence to nature, uh, is, is is being taken away from people because of uh, of our modern uh, way of living. An example from. Here in China, from this area of China, would be the the Yangtze River dolphin. Um, yes, a freshwater dolphin that was very common 100 years ago, and as well with pressure on the river from industry, uh, from fishing, from uh, all kinds of pollution, the the population went into decline uh, over the last hundred years mm. and. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a new study done to try to see what the population was. They knew it had gone very low and they, they actually did not find one single yeah. Uh, yeah. Yangtze River dolphin. You know, freshwater dolphins are rare. Uh, it was particular to this part of the world. It would seem that it's gone now forever. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's your sort of any, uh, emblematic example, in fact, Dan, isn't it? 
Yes. Uh, and, and it's 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 the disappearance of species like that that uh, wake us up in a sense, you know, that draw attention to it. But what's very important to remember is that the disappearance of a tiny insect won't get our attention, and yet, okay. and yet that is as complex as I've said before on every level that biology can study, and as significant in its own way uh, yeah. as as. as the, the handful that we sort of that we engage our attention more immediately with, and presumably each species that disappears, that does something in the, yeah. the cycle of of life that is removed, yeah. that has all the consequences. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and again, beyond that, and, and more deeply though, then something of God yes. is lost to yeah. our experience. Uh, and, you know, sure. think that, that 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 wonderful metaphor, Thomas Aquinas, you know. Uh, that each of these, there's some, there is something of God in every in every life form. Also in Laudato Si, in paragraph 36, Pope Francis mentions, you know, the importance of um, intergenerational justice. Yeah. Uh, you know that what is lost in our generation yeah. would be paid for by the by subsequent generations. Yeah, obviously, is a huge issue that people yeah. who live 100 years after us will never see some of the same flowers or insects or birds yeah. that we consider to be normal. Yeah. We'll only see a fraction of it, in fact, Dan. There's a loss of, of uh, experience and contact with nature, the possibilities there. But the, uh, in parallel with that, uh, there, there's the bleeding of, the, of resources. Uh, that should be at the service of future generations. You know, the extent to which we are uh, using up the earth's resources uh, of water, of fish stocks, of metals, etc., etc. Intergenerational justice is a, a hugely uh, fundamental aspect of why, uh, why, why of, the, the mor of the moral grounding for engagement with, with these issues. In terms of intergenerational uh, issues, um, would say here in China, uh, 1,000 years is considered a reasonably short period of time. Yeah. Um, but I suppose if we take, if we, if biodiversity continues to decline, I mean, a thousand years will bring a huge, huge change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I suppose really politicians and governments, whether it is here in China or elsewhere, they, they should really have that long time frame yeah. in mind. When we talk about the future, we, um, we, we seldom go beyond a decade, you know, right. 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 years. Occasionally we'll talk about, about uh, 2050, when the world population will be, will be at 10 billion, etc. cetera. But, but as you say, the time frame, the time frame needs to be centuries. You know, yeah. uh, let's, stick it, let's stick it one century, you know. Uh, if we continue as we are doing, uh, what the consequences will be a century hence. That's what the real blindness is in relation to the uh, inevitably what will be the case unless we act now. Uh, and that explains the intensity of the language that sometimes occurs in our You know, they, this is not scaremongering. This is what's going to happen. But our ability to think in those time frames is so limited. If we're to assume that, you know, people are to live fruitfully and meaningfully 1,000 years from now. Yeah. There's a huge amount needs to be done in the next 50 years to ensure that they will have. Absolutely, absolutely, Dan. Mm -hmm. but, but look at the difficulty we find in actually doing the things we know we need to do uh, in order to get, in order, in order to, uh, get the minimum uh, reduction in, in, in the changes taking place. It, it shows the enormity of... The, of the challenge uh, facing us, and why it's so important to engage in whatever level we can with it. So there's certainly a need for creativity, John. <laughs> <laughs> never, never was there such a need, Dan. Creativity <laughs> and virtue. <laughs> All together, yes, yes. yes. Thank you for listening to Jubilee for the Earth, Biodiversity and Our Sacred Story. We hope you'll join us for episode two, A New Kind of Economy, where we'll discuss the role our economic systems play in biodiversity loss. 
This podcast was produced by the Missionary Society of St. Columba. To learn more about our work to protect God's creation and how you can get involved, please visit www.columbancenter.org backslash biodiversity. The theme music for this podcast is Moment of Inspiration by Purple Planet Music. All other credits are listed in the show notes. If you like this podcast, please consider leaving us a review. We'd love to hear from you.